Could I get your name and job title, please? My name is Santoki Nagulendran. I'm co-founder and co-host of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. And I've got you on to talk about Nicholas Puran because he's fun and people don't talk about him enough. And you just did an interview with him for, was it Crick Info or Cricketer? Yeah, Crick Info, yeah. I knew I read it somewhere. Uh, let's go back to the start of his career. Uh, I'm not an under-19 uh, person because there's already 3,000 professional cricketers in the world. I don't need to also know about a 17-year-old from Bangladesh just yet. Um, but my memory was that he was one of the few people from an under-19 tournament that really popped back in the day and everyone was talking about him. Yeah, because he sort of defined, well, even to this day, his defining career moment has been that 143 against Australia in the quarterfinals. And um, I think he scored over 300 runs from his six matches. So he sort of made a name for himself in the under-19, especially in the region. People started talking about him. I mean, in Trinidad, he'd sort of been groomed for being the next future star from a young, young age. But this kind of got the whole region talking about him. But then, unfortunately, other things happened, other circumstances happened, which sort of derailed his career for the next year, two years. Yeah, so he had, so he does the under 19 World Cup, comes back, he plays three games for Trinidad in first class cricket. I think he might have played a couple of list A or something as well around that period, or, or certainly played some other representative cricket. Then he has the car accident. Um, my memory of the car accident and the way that he told me was he had the car accident and Trinidad gave him money to get his rehab done. And then halfway through that, they decided uh, that they weren't going to continue to fund his rehab. Uh, if you ask um, Puran, he talks a lot about Gus Logie, the former um, West Indian uh, short leg legend. Uh, not always in the most positive uh, terms. I think that's uh, I think that's the, a fair um, uh, way of putting it. But that was that was really derailing his career. But it also shows what how quickly West Indies can lose out on um, next generation talent. Yeah, so he had that car crash, I think, January 2015, and it sort of took him six months just to be able to walk unassisted. And you kind of imagine being mm. at one point, he thought he would never play cricket again. And that's kind of been since since then, you sort of seen him play so many franchise tournaments, you get the feeling that he's just grateful that he's able to play cricket. It's always sort of in the back of his mind that that yeah. opportunity was was taken away from him. Um, and as you said, he had problems with the Trinidad and Tobago cricket board. He ended up having to play for his local club, Queen's Park, instead of the Trinidad and Tobago national setup because they wouldn't medically clear him, which sort of linked to them not funding his medical rehab. Um, and it was all messy and typical West Indies administration issues. But since then, he sort of defined himself as the quintessential freelance franchise cricketer. Yeah, he so he started playing. I, I'm trying to remember. I think he played tournaments in in Seattle. He might have played in Houston as well in America. So he made a little bit of money from that. He was very lucky. I don't, I don't mean lucky completely, but he he was very lucky that he signed with Insignia, who I think at that stage were already Darren Sammy's agent. They were already Karen Pollard's agent. Uh, everyone except for Dwayne Bravo and Chris Gale, I think they had at one stage in West Indies cricket. And they got him an IPL gig and a BPL gig when no one really knew who he was outside of that under-19 um, thing. And he basically developed that way. I don't know if you know the uh, the, the, the the full story of it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure um, um, I've talked to him about it. And he was at someone's house for like a barbecue or a dinner or something. It was all the Trini boys were there. And he um, he literally said to them, do you think I'll be able to like just develop as a cricketer by just playing franchise leagues? And I think it was Dwayne Bravo took him aside and said, yes, but it's going to be very, very hard. Um, and this is how it's going to be. Um, and he did. And he just went off and played all these random leagues because, he, you know, he didn't have a first class team. Yeah, exactly. And I think... Oh. Um... Oh, Amanda. Yeah. Uh, so I think 2016 yeah. CPL, he got bought for 90,000 by 90,000 US dollars by um, the Barbados Tridents, who were obviously then captained by Kyron Pollard. And that was the same, to put it into context, that was the same fee that Andre Russell got to play for Jamaica Talawas. And this was Nicholas Poran, who hadn't played <laughs> a professional game for over a year. <laughs> so that sort of sums up how well, like, the Trinidadian posse, as you mentioned, Pollard, Narayan, DJ Bravo, they sort of highly regarded him in that sense that Pollard was willing to take a gamble mm. with him. And the Mumbai Indians the next year, 2017, Kyron Pollard actually arranged for Nicholas Puran to play in an empty stadium in um, Mumbai as a trial to get him in. And once he'd done well in that, mm. Mumbai Indians signed him, which sort of shows the extent, also shows the pulling power of Kyron Pollard and 
Robin Singh as well, fellow Trinidadian, who was head coach of Barbados Tridents at the time. He was obviously in the Mumbai setup as well. Just how much they were sort of pulling for him and how how highly regarded he was seen as mm. to, to go to that extent to fly him out to Mumbai, play in an empty stadium and then consequently signed, considering, as you said, he hadn't had much cricket behind him. Yeah, I remember um, uh, yeah, Polly doesn't send me many, very many messages unless there's something on his mind. One of the few times he did send me a message was when I wrote about um, uh, Puran. Like he does almost treat him like uh, like a little brother. Like there's a real strong bond b b between, you know, Karen Pollard and Nicholas Puran. And I think if he hadn't have had that, I think it's very possible he still would have been a successful cricketer, but he might have had floated through his career a little bit more. But because he had the very good agent and, and you know, the links to all these different people and everyone who saw him, from what I could tell, was like, well, this is obviously, you know, West Indies' next great batter, even if he didn't have the sort of background that you and I would sort of typically think of as a first-class cricketer. Yeah, and let's not forget he was also banned by Cricket West Indies for 10 months from playing any domestic cricket because he wanted to play in the Bangladesh Premier League. And so, like you said, if he didn't have those connections to other franchises, he sort of would have been left in the lurch, really, being banned from domestic cricket. He ended up playing in Hong Kong, Seattle, as you mentioned, in America, Bangladesh Premier League. And so he sort of honed his skills at various franchises across the world rather than at his home domestic club, Trinidad and Tobago. And, and when he was banned, that, when you're talking about that, I mean, my understanding was that he was actually happy to play, but he'd had a falling out with Trinidad and he was being offered all these other offers anyway. So it wasn't like they were about to play him. And this is the interesting thing. He's used now by a lot of people to say, look, ah, oh, the young people don't want to play uh, first-class cricket anymore. Look at Nicholas Perron. But when you talk to him, he's like, of course I wanted to play first-class cricket. Like he's not, he's not one of the first players to ever turn his back on first-class cricket. He had an actual issue with at first the Trinidad board and then the West Indian board, which basically it could have just completely ruined his career. Yeah, essentially, uh, unless he had contacts at other franchises, we wouldn't see him playing cricket in 2022 because of that, because he'd been banned and outcast. He was sort of left left by himself. So in one way, it's, kind of, it's sort of remarkable. He's kind of reintegrated himself into West Indies cricket and become dedicated to the national side because he would be justified to sort of just become a permanent freelance franchise cricket based on how how he's been treated. So so that is very interesting as well. And also, like you said, when I spoke to him, Test cricket is very much, he sees it as the pinnacle still. I guess he's he's 26, coming up to 27. So he's still of the age group that sees Test cricket as being the pinnacle for a cricketer. He very much wants to play. He spoke to Sir Desmond Haynes, the West Indies selector in January, and said he's up for playing first-class cricket, uh, Test cricket. It's just... The problem is obviously as a common problem in modern cricket, how do you play first class cricket? How do you set aside time to play first class cricket? When the money on offer, he'll be at IPL in May when West Indies are resuming their first class season. So how do you sort of balance that out? From speaking to him, I sort of got the impression that he was hoping there'd be a compromise and he'd be fast tracked into the test side rather than having to commit to playing for Trinidad and Tobago in the first class setup for 75, 100 US dollars a game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, well, he played three games over the first, what, six years of his career. I'm just having a look. He's up to five. The other two games, are they both West Indies A? I know at least one of them was a West Indies A game. I don't think he's played for Trinidad in a first-class game, has he? So S since he, since he, when he was young. Yeah, since when he was young. The last two games were the two West Indies A games against New Zealand A. And even in yeah. even in those matches, he captained, he he was wicket keeper, he took a wicket, um, <laughs> right arm off break. So he was all he was all over the place. He sort of dominated that first class match. He hit an innings, I think, sixty nine or sixty three balls, so kept that strike rate up. So he's definitely someone who could do well in first class cricket. It's just whether West Indies wanna take the risk and throw him into the deep end. Yeah, I, I, my, my memory of that, I'm just having a look at the scorecard. It was an incredibly strong uh, A game. So Glenn Phillips, Tim, Tim Seifert, Mark Chapman, uh, Jimmy Neesham, Ratchan Ravindra, uh, Bracewell played as well, Ish Sodi. Um, and then you've got Kyle Mays, Jaden Seals, Romario Shepard, Akimo Paul, Rakim Cornwall, is it Brandon King. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, or Fabian Allen. Oh, it, it was it was it was like an all star A game that one. Um, it, it was absolutely phenomenal. But uh, you know, when you look at him, there's nothing in his game that suggests that he can't move to first-class cricket and to test cricket. 
Um, I'd still say, I mean, it'd be interesting to see what you think, but outside of Brathwaite, I think he, and, and maybe Hetmeyer, he's probably still in the top three talents as far as just pure batting um, in the West Indies. Yeah, 100%. His, his technique suggests that. And as we've seen in T20 cricket, where there's before he sort of came down the order five, six, seven as as a finisher, I think now you've seen him develop and move up the order into that three, four role because his technique is so good. Franchises are relying on him to carry and anchor that innings. Yeah, it's, it's that combo role. So when he first came in, so the, the breakthrough season he had in the CPL, I'm trying to remember if it was that first year in Barbados when he came in in the middle order and sort of smashed the ball everywhere. Um, you know, at that point, it was there was... There was no doubt that he was a very good player, but people couldn't quite work out what to do with him because he was going to have to bat at six or seven. He's really just every year added little bits to his game until, you know, he's, well, he bats number three now for the West Indies, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So for number, he bats at number three for West Indies. He's done very well. He hit over 60 in every innings against India in the, in the three match series last month. Um, so yeah, he's, he's really developed and matured as a player. And it's interesting because when I spoke to him about his stint at, Punjab Kings last season where he averaged 7.75 he sort of said as well because he was coming in later on as a finisher he didn't face that many balls really so in some regards he didn't really see it as a failure because he wasn't soaking up balls he was going for ducks for one ball ducks two ball ducks so it'd be interesting to see sort of how the Sunrisers utilize him do they keep him as a finisher is what he's known as in the IPL or do they look at what West Indies have done and move him up to uh, position three yeah I, I mean I think for me he's kind of like a Glenn Maxwell number four. Um, you don't really want him in at the power play. In fact, I think the West Indies make a mistake sometimes allowing him to go in during the power play. I think that, you know, you you basically, you make sure he doesn't go in in the power play, but the minute the power play is over, the next wicket is, is when you send him in. He's so good at getting spin and the way that he manipulates it. And if he's in later, he'll smash everyone around everywhere. The, the interesting thing is, did you talk to him much about, uh, I mean, uh, let, let, well, let's briefly mention the IPL stuff. He had probably the worst IPL season I've ever seen anyone have last year after having a great half a season and then an absolutely great season. So he had about a year and a half in the IPL where he dominated. And then last year, I mean, you said, so he made a golden duck. Did he make a diamond duck as well? Yeah. Diamond Did he run duck, out yeah. without facing a ball maybe? Yeah. Yep. Um, he, he went out second ball in one game. Uh, it was it was actually hilarious how bad his season was. He, he obviously would not have felt that way. Um, psychologically it sounds like he's handled that pretty well though from from your chat yeah i think um obviously in 2020 he did well partly because kl rahul gail agarwal they were batting so well when he was coming in there wasn't that pressure whereas last season we saw gail in particular struggled for for the punjab king so puran was coming in with a lot more pressure but when i spoke to him he did he brushed it off he sort of said i've been doing well international cricket and people should judge me on that recent series rather than last year's IPL. So for me, it doesn't seem like he fears anything. And we talked about the price tag. Obviously, that's going to come into it, 1.4 million US dollars. And he he also said, like, it, he obviously takes note of it, but it doesn't add any pressure to his game. And one thing that was interesting was he was playing, when I spoke to him, he was playing T10 cricket um, in Trinidad with Narayan Pollard, Evan Lewis. And he attributed that because he feels T10 cricket is something which adds that fearlessness into your game. And mm. so probably playing for West Indies at number three, because he had pressure on him to carry the innings, it was sort of a release playing T10 cricket, kind of getting that fearlessness back into him, expanding his uh, variety of shots. So he was using that as preparation for coming into this year's IPL. Mm. I mean, the other thing is, it does tell you that, like, I, as I just said, he's probably had the worst season. I can't, I'm, I'm trying to think of an overseas player who's had a worst season in the IPL that's played as many games as he got and, and struggled as much as he did. But the other side of it is the fact that he went for 1.4 million, people are starting to work out that there is variance. Do you remember when Tam Tamal Mills had a bit of a bad season and we just never saw him in the IPL again, right? Like teams are now starting to go, okay, we get this. Yes, he's had a bad season, but it was a dramatically weird bad season. So we're willing to sort of work, you know, uh, move on from that. So that's very interesting. What I thought was, and I've thought this for a little a while watching him, is he started to struggle a little bit more, especially when the balls bowled short at him. Um, and I wonder if, and I know there's a, there's a real thinking in the West Indies that one of the reasons that Chris Gale was such a good uh, T20 player is because he had so long as a test player and his game was so developed by that point. Do you think that there's a, 
there's something to be said for maybe the new generation of West Indian cricketers coming into T20. It's not that they're not as talented as the ones who came in before. But they don't have that grounding of first-class cricket and test cricket for when you get to the absolute top level. So the IPL and the international stuff, they're maybe just not as rounded as players. Yeah, 100%. I think that lack of foundation, as you said, Paul Rand struggles with back of the length balls. And that's something you really learn from playing first-class cricket in the Red Bull game. So he's sort of had to learn on the job learning from IPL top franchise tournaments how to play that. But I don't think you can really do that without that first-class cricket ground. And then it's something I think DJ Barbo, not DJ Barbo, Ian Bishop mentioned on, on commentary in a recent game that T20, this new T20 generation, Hetmeyer, Poor, and they do need to invest in playing first-class cricket because it will benefit their T20 mm. game long-term. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting one because I could see why for most of the time that it wouldn't actually make had much of an impact, right? Like if you think about it from a, uh, from a, you know, if, if he's playing in, in the, um, the Abu Dhabi classic or wherever, right. Um, and, and some of these other, you know, if I think he played in the Canadian league when that was around, there's a lot of leagues where he could sort of stroll up, uh, right arm, right arm, medium fast. He's going to hit out of the park. Anyone who spins the ball back into him, he's going to hit out of the park. And maybe if there's a guy who can bowl a couple of bounces, he just gets off strike and it's not a problem. When he gets international cricket and when he gets to IPL, it's actually harder to hide those sorts of weaknesses because you do have more bowlers who can exploit that. Um, and the other thing is that we know a lot about him, right? It wasn't that long ago we didn't know anything about him. Our teams know a lot about him now. So he does actually have to develop. Does, uh, did you talk to him about any of that or is that the sort of thing that he sort of brushed off with you? So he sort of said for him, he doesn't see it as more technical issues. He sees it as more mental issues. So about mental barriers and kind of having confidence in his game and his ability to bat. So it sounds, I mean, it could be, it could be a case of him not wanting to give away what he perceives as people's flaws of him. But he did reiterate to me that he saw it as more of a mental thing, a psychological thing, building back his confidence after last year's IPL. And it'd be interesting as well with his, um, we talked about his fee, 1.4 million US dollars. I guess it wouldn't have helped either that the Sunrisers, Murali, their spin coach, sort of said, yeah, we paid that for Puran because we couldn't get Ishan Kishan and we weren't sure about Johnny Best though. So we just needed any international wicketkeeper. So I don't, I don't know if that would have helped his confidence going into the IPL. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite weird. I mean, what do you think of his wicket keeping? I remember years ago when I was, you know, building a, a franchise and I was hoping to get Puran in and, and I said, should we get him in as wicket keeper? And they were like, well, no, because he can't keep, right? So uh, he's kind of, uh, I mean, at the moment, West Indies might have the two worst or three worst wicket keepers in Shy Hope, um, De Silva and Puran from a pure technical standpoint. They're all pretty much batters who, who pick up the gloves. His wicket keeping is very, very hit and miss, isn't it? Yeah, one hundred percent. It's definitely not. I'd say it wouldn't be a strong point of his. And obviously, at Punjab Kings, KL Rahul kept wicket, so he hasn't got that experience either. Um, when I did talk mm. to him, he said he he enjoys fielding just as much as wicket keeping. So it's not as if wicket keeping is like that's a, a bad a, sign. Passion. That's never yeah. a good sign. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> when someone say, yeah, you know, I also like that. It's just like no, <laughs> wicket keepers do not like to field unless they're doing it just for fun, occasionally in slips to see how they go. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's quite interesting. Also, how he's going to go in a full season of keeping up to the stumps to, to you know, spinners. So, obviously, he does it in the West Indies, but a lot of the West Indian spinners are a bit more, they're a bit more containing bowlers. He might get, yeah. a, a, you know, a slightly more dramatic spinning to go up against. I mean, to be fair, he plays spin very good. So, it's not that he can't pick it. It's just that his hands and feet don't exactly move the way that you want a professional wicket keeper to move. Yeah, exactly. I think it'll be, I think it'll be very tough for him. Um, keep into attacking spinners as you said on, on these Indian pitches and it'd be interesting to see how keeping wicket affects his game whether it affects his actual batting having to keep for 20 overs as well under that high pressure environment one of the other interesting things I, th I think about so when he had the bad IPL season there was a lot of people sort of going ah oh, he's a busted flush I think a lot of people forget that he had an incredible 2019 World Cup yeah 100% and Funny story, if you ask my wife, who's the greatest cricket player of all time, she'll tell, she'll tell you Nicholas Puran because the one game she's seen live was um, West Indies against Pakistan. And Puran, I think he hit 34 of 19, but just the way his movement and sort of the frantic nature of his batting and also the fact that looking at him, so Chris Gale played in that game and you sort of looking at him as someone who doesn't watch cricket, you'd expect him to hit sixes. 
Whereas Paul Rand didn't look mm. like someone who could clear the boundary. So she was completely captivated by his play. And to this day, if you if you ask her, because she's got no context, but just also the fact how well he played in that game, she will say he's the greatest cricket player of all time. But that's sort of that's sort of a good barometer as to a star because someone who doesn't watch cricket, if you're captivated and there's something about player, they mm. obviously have qualities kind of that reach out beyond beyond just what happens in the match. So he has got that star quality. And as you said, he put on the runs in the 2019 World Cup. But if you talk to him about it, he'll say it was a massive disappointment in terms of how the team performed. Yeah. I mean, I remember, I think that's when I interviewed him. I think it was during that World Cup. And he, he was very down on where the West Indies had gone. They obviously, I think they came into it with higher hopes than maybe people from the outside. I mean, if we remember he was um, going up again, you know, they were... They just qualified ahead of Scotland. And uh, so from the outside, we were all thinking not much was going to come from it. West Indies had a poor series, but he had an incredible one. He was he probably not, you, uh, you know, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't have been in everyone's World Cup team at that tournament, but quite a few of us had, us, had him in the, in the World Cup. That was also the period where I thought teams started to work him out a little bit more. I don't know if it was that Pakistan game or if it was the Bangladesh game. It was one of the games I went to um, where he they came on and they had a leg spinner or a left arm finger spinner bowling to him, and they had no deep mid wicket. Hmm. And I'm just sitting there going, "They no one has any idea who this guy is." He was so under the radar, despite the fact that you know what we've talked about the under nineteen World Cup, you know, going to the Bangladesh Premier League when he was very young, the, the you know the IPL tryouts and all that sort of stuff. Basic information teams didn't know. This next generation, this from 2019 through to now, so this last two or three years, he's become one of the most famous T20 players on the planet. He had that big, big bash, the big, big bash season, huge big bash season. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously he had a year and a half in the IPL that was massive as well. He's now a frontline West Indian player. It's a completely different era of his career that he's moving into now, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. You'd say he's a top star in the West Indies. He's sort of... It's kind of strange because he's, he's what, 26 now, but he's up until probably the last year and a half, he's sort of been viewed still as a kid. And that's partly because of the longevity of the likes of Gale and Bravo. They still sort of took the headlines in that West Indies Everyone team. else is so old. Yeah, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> the so, rest of the team. It's it's, not, it's, 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 he's not young, it's, they're old. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an unusual situation because in the, in the West Indies, we sort of view Hetmeyer and Poran as up-and-coming sort of young players, whereas, in fact, they're coming up to the peak of what should be their career. But it's sort of having to live in the shadows of these guys who have defined the format. So now's really, with, with DJ Barber retiring, Gail stepping out of the team, um, we sort of see Poran being held up to the limelight. And so, as you said, teams know about him very well. And the amount of cricket he plays for franchises and internationally, there's so much footage about him. So it's about whether he can keep up to that and work on technical abilities to get ahead of the game. Uh, t tell me about him personally. So I think that other than meeting him once or twice and then interviewing him, um, I don't think I've I've chatted to him that much. He's a very intense young guy, though, at times. Like, he's... um. He's very focused and he thinks a lot. He's, I w I'm not sure if shy is the right word, but he's not a very outgoing person. I found him very, very intense and very specific um, uh, with with what he what he said and the way that, that he chats. He's not like a gregarious or comfortable person when I chatted to him. Is that the kind of vibe that you got off him as well? Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting one because this, again, might link to the whole Gail Bravo thing because he, he comes across as a sort of shy and quiet person. But I don't know whether that's just because he's been in teams with such extroverted characters because in recent yeah. series against England and India, we've seen backstage footage after the matches. He's sort of leading the team talks and he's very charismatic, yeah. which kind of goes against the image I had of him. When I did talk to him, as you said, he was slightly reserved, very intense. But he, one thing is he can analyse the game very well. So talking about batting and the power yeah. play, different positions. And it'd be interesting because he went to the same college, Naparima College in Trinidad, which Samuel Badri, Darren Ganga went to, um, who are obviously great communicator analysts. So it'd be interesting to see if his upbringing, his school, has kind of taught him how to articulate himself and analyse the game in a, in a certain way. Uh, so I don't know anything about that. Is it, and I'm only basing this on the fact that Samuel Badri um, uh, is is very smart and feels very posh to me. Is that a posh school? Is that like a better area of town, you know, compared to where Karen Pollard comes from? Yeah, it would be a better it'd be a better um, sort of school area. But also, it, it seems to looking at the alumni who went there, Sir Trevor McDonald, Ganga, Badri, um, the famous author Sam Selvon, they all seem to be very good communicators. 
So that's obviously something yeah. something that he would have he would have had in his grounding. So maybe it's just a case of him being in the shadows of these West Indian stars. He hasn't had the outlet to sort of articulate himself. And maybe going forward, now he'll eventually be West Indies captain, you imagine, sooner rather than later. It will sort of come out his communication abilities and his personality more than anything. I think for a big West Indian star, we haven't really got to see much of his personality. Mm. Yeah, he's. I think. I think that's on purpose. He's very, as as we both said, like very intense and very, you know, reserved with with what he says. Um, I know that there was a particular journalist he did an interview with. He was very upset that that journalist didn't go big on uh, the Gus Logie stuff. That, that's a really. He feel he felt very let down by Gus Logie, and he feels, and he's very po- passionate in the way that he gets that across. But obviously, it's at a certain point, so it's almost a gossipy. Um, story, if you know what I mean, whereas the rest of his story is so fascinating. Um, do you think, I'm going to throw this at you, uh, this is not to say that Craig Brathwaite's about to lose his job because he might be about to win this test series against England, although by the time this podcast has come out, he either will or won't have won this test series against England. Um, but do you think uh, Perun is a potential test captain, which is incredible to think, as we're saying here, and he's played five first-class games, but do you think that is a possibility for him? I think it is a possibility, but that kind of reflects the lack of obvious captains in in the West Indies uh, test setup. I would say he has he West Indies have clearly groomed him to be a captain in a white ball format, so he's obviously got that tactical and leadership ability. So if if he was to get a few test caps, I can imagine if Brathwaite was to step down or they removed him as captain, poor and if he's been playing a few test matches by that point, he'd probably be the first choice to become captain. Um, it what you would say. Two years ago, you would have said Hetmeyer would be assuming to be the captain at some point, but he's sort of fallen off the radar mm. in terms of highlighting and showing his captaincy ability. So I would say just purely down to the lack of obvious leaders in the region, Puran, his name would be in the mix for sure. So Hetmeyer was the under-19 captain, and at you know at that period, he was the one that everyone was thinking about, uh, you know, being a future leader. Um, obviously, he's had problems with with his own body um, of recent times, and had some problems with the board as well. It just feels like that Puran has sort of overcome him a little bit more. And as you said, he, it, there's absolutely no doubt that they are pushing him. I, I don't know if this is, you know, Phil Simmons and and Kyron Pollard, or if this is a whole West Indian cricket thing. But it really feels like they're pushing him more and more towards this leadership role for Puran. It'd be really interesting to see how he develops with that um, and if he changes his sort of public persona um, to the sort of stuff that you're talking about that you see in the behind the scenes footage where he's a bit more um, vocal, I suppose, is the best way of putting it. Um, but but what a remarkable story it would be and a very modern West Indies story if he does end up captaining the test team considering, uh, you know, he once had his local board not pay his fees and was suspended by the, uh, you know, the, the West Indies cricket board and then had to go play in Seattle because he couldn't get cricket anywhere else. It's it's such a modern West Indian cricket story, Nicholas Puran. Incredible talent and almost had to overcome everything else that's been thrown at him. Yeah, and I think to to be a true West Indian story, he'll probably be captain on debut, his test debut. They'll probably just make him captain and say, yeah. Here you go. That, that that would sort of that would sort of end the end the chapter of the poor man's remarkable West Indian story. I love that he'd be captain, wicketkeeper, batting first drop in his first test. It'd be like he'll be like the Legion Mon of a new generation, like just sort of completely dropped in from nowhere and have to do that. But but you're right. I mean, the thing is that he's 26. He's had this remarkable career. I don't even know. You say he wants to play test cricket. I got that feeling from him when I talked to him a couple of years ago as well. He, I think that it's still a big, it's an unticked box for Nicholas Puran. It, like he's already shown at the World Cup and the IPL that he can be one of the best players in two different forms of white cricket. I think that he certainly the last the last thing on his on his sort of bucket list is starring as a as a West Indian test player. It'd be interesting to know if also being the captain of any of the Indian, uh, the West Indian teams is also something that is, um, you know, something that he always thought about when he was young or, or whether he didn't because um, Hetmeyer was coming through at a similar age. Mm. You see, this is the thing. I'd like to take it as face value that he wants to play test cricket, but we also sp- spoke to Evan Lewis um, on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast and he said test cricket was still on his radar. He'd love to play it. But part of me does wonder whether these West Indian fans in particular will know the complete backlash Chris Gale got about 10, 12 years ago for saying... Test cricket is dead to him. Whether they're, they're, this is sort of a PR line, keep saying you're gonna you're gonna play Test cricket. Yeah, Test cricket's the pinnacle, and then 
never eventually play it. Um, so it'd be interesting to see. I do think Poran is more genuine than Evan Lewis in terms of wanting to play Red Bull cricket, Test cricket. Um, but it'd be interesting to see the pathway, how sort of cricket West Indies and him work to to kind of get to that route, which is the main thing. Because I don't think, just by principle, I don't think West Indies will allow him a free pass to get into the Test side without having to commit to some sort of domestic um, first class season. So the pathway is very tough. It'd be interesting to see. At the stage he is in his career now, you'd imagine in the next two years he has to he has to be in the test team or he never will. Or if he does come into the test mm. team after that, he'll be past his peak. So it's sort of a critical juncture in terms of his test career ambitions at the moment. Yeah, it's really interesting to see what West Indies cricket do. You know, under Ricky Skerritt, it's certainly been much more inclusive than it was under Dave Cameron, where you were with us or against us. Mm. They almost need to come up with a separate, the old, the old way doesn't work, right? <laughs> the, the first class setup doesn't work for these modern players. So maybe there's another way of doing it and saying, okay, well, you need to make yourself available for five West Indian A games or a West Indian A tour um, or two tours in a row or whatever that may be. Um, and you can qual and you will happily make you qualify from there because I mean, Evan Lewis, Hetmeyer, Puran. I mean, even someone like, um, you know, someone like Obed McCoy, you know, how many six foot five, um, 90 mile an hour left arm bowlers are there around in the world? And, you know, I, Obed's not a first class cricketer, really, it, you know, and, and, and he might never be a first class cricketer. And um, I got him his agent back in the day. I don't think his agent's like pushing him to become a test cricketer. So it's depending on whether someone like Obed wants to become, uh, you know, a, a test cricketer in that point. And it's like, but if there's no way to scoop up these guys or uh, keep them uh, involved, then you're going to miss out on a whole generation of cricketers. And you've already missed out on a whole generation of cricketers because the last board basically was at war with their players. The, the great news is they're no longer at war with their players, but now they have to come up with a compromise that kind of makes everyone happy or, as most compromises, makes everyone a little bit unhappy, but unhappy enough. Yeah, exactly. And I think... It's, it wouldn't even be un, entirely unprecedented. I mean, I, it obviously applies to spinners more, but Sunny Ramadan had only played like two first-class games before he was picked for the test side. Soon on Orion had played like six before he was picked. So Puran, he's played five. I mean, it's whether they see, okay, he's, he's, got, he's played some first-class cricket. We, that could kind of tick the criteria. Or as you said, if they do say, listen, play half a season in the West Indies, um, and then you can play. But the, the question is, if he was to play half a season, he would have to miss out on a big contract at, fan, at some franchise or a white ball series or West Indies. So how do you sort of balance that schedule and timetable? But it will be interesting to see how flexible they are to pull. And as you said, we've already missed out on a generation of stars because of the board player dispute. So it would be a shame, a real shame to miss out on this current generation as well. So as you said, Skerritt has been very flexible and open to integrating players into the side. So I'm very interested to see it in the next year or so, how they sort of communicate and have dialogue with Puran. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Pleasure.